Hello everyone, my name is Adian and welcome to Atelier AG. For this video I've made a sculpture of a lich, an ancient undead wizard. I will be going over how I've sculpted it, how I've made the plinth and how I've painted it. So I really hope you enjoy it and let's get right into it. As always, I start by making an armature out of metal wire. I spun this metal wire myself. You can check out my jungle spirit video if you want to see how. I'm gonna try to link it in the corner of the screen, but if not, you can find the link in the description. I start out with making the spine and the head out of the same piece. I curve the spine slightly to mimic a natural pose. By doing this, I already add some proportions to the sculpt, which makes sculpting a lot easier. I then use aluminum foil to bulk up the torso. This is because the thicker your clay, the longer it has to bake, but this means you might over bake thinner parts. I think clay that has been baked for too long becomes brittle or it might crack or even break. For the arms I'm using a thinner wire that I wrap around the spine and then fix in place with milliput. As you can see the arms are way too long. I do this so that I can determine the placement for the joints afterwards. I draw out a quick sketch where I can choose where I want the joints. I can then place my armature on top and bend the wire on exactly the right spot. Next up is choosing a pose for the sculpt. Since I am making a lich, an undead wizard, I thought I would have him hold up his arms as if he is casting a spell. I bend the arms in place and try to imagine how it will look when it's sculpted. When I'm satisfied with the pose, I cover the armature with a thin layer of green stuff. This fixes the pose, but it also creates a better surface for the polymer clay to stick on later. The last part of the armature are the hands. I sketch them onto my previous sketch so that I can get the proportions right. I then take a thin brass wire and use the sketch to bend it on the right places. I twist the wire for the fingers so that it is as thin as possible and strong as well. I use the excess wire to attach the hands to the arms. For this project I mostly used Sculpey Firm, a polymer clay that hardens when you bake it in the oven. While sculpting, it remains soft so that you can always go back and change things. This allows me to take all the time I need to get the sculpt exactly how I want it. I never sculpted human anatomy and clothing on this size, so to be able to do it without a time limit was really helpful. I start out by placing pieces of clay where the muscles would be and blend them together. Even though some parts will be covered with clothing, it is still a good idea to sculpt the anatomy underneath this makes sculpting realistic clothing a lot easier. For the head, I first sculpt a ball and I add some clay for the jawline. I then take my ballpoint tool and choose where the eyes will come. Besides looking really funny, I can see if the eyes are in the right place and then I slowly widen the eye sockets. As you can see, the face begins to look like a skull, and this is exactly what I'm going for. I want the face to look very emaciated, so the skull has to be visible. 
I then add small pieces of clay on the places that I want to pronounce more, like the eyebrows and cheekbones, and I blend them into the rest of the clay. Using some reference pictures of skulls, I try to get closer and closer to a realistic face. It is also really important to get the face symmetrical. I constantly turn around the piece to look from different angles so that I can see what parts still need some work. For the eyes, I first place a small ball inside the eye sockets. I move it around to get it in the center and I gently press it into the sculpt. Uh, using very thin rolls of clay, I create the eyelids above and below the eye and the outside of the eyelids are then blended into the skin of the eye sockets. The hood was quite a challenge for me since I have never sculpted one before and it would be an important centerpiece of this bust. After a few attempts I finally found a method that worked well for me I looked into textile patterns for hoods and I tried to mimic this. I took this pattern and I tried to fold it over the head, trying to merge the pieces on the right places. While squeezing and stretching the clay into place, I could already feel where the hood wanted to fold. Because the clay is a bit thicker than actual textile would be, the folds between the neck and the shoulder don't fall in place naturally. I added pieces of clay to accentuate the folds and I used some thinner metal tools to create the pleats in the hood. On the front of the hood the material still looked too thick so I took a hobby knife and chamfered the edges. I then smoothened out the chamfer and by doing this the hood looks a lot thinner but it still retains a lot of strength. As an extra detail on the hood I wanted to make some big stitches on it. I parted the hood with a hobby knife and I pressed in a stitch pattern with my finest ballpoint sculpting tool. I then rolled a very fine piece of clay that I placed into the pattern and gently pushed it into the clay. Then it was time to work on the vest. After sculpting the edges around the arms and bulking up the vest, I used a thick ballpoint tool to sketch out the folds in the textile. I then added some clay on the bulges and blended them in. In between the big bulges I added some more clay to create some smaller folds in the vest and finally I used some isopropyl alcohol and a brush to smooth out the sculpt. Because I can't remove any clay after it has been baked I decided to add some more detail into the vest. I used a flat tool to press in the parting line of the vest. I also added some straps to the vest. Um, this could have been done in epoxy clay after baking and in hindsight it might have been a better idea because the vest came out great and I risked messing it up by doing this. Fortunately everything was okay and it looks great. At this point I decided to bake the piece. I didn't work on the hands yet because they stick out quite far from the center. This makes working on them more difficult because the whole model starts to move as you are trying to sculpt. After baking, the sculpt is hard and I can grab onto it to sculpt the hands. I'm using a small toaster oven for baking my clay. I do not use this oven for food. On the package it doesn't say anything about food safety, but I don't think it is good for you.
When it's finished, you can either let it cool in the oven or take it out with a plier. Since it was about 10 degrees Celsius in my workshop, I thought it would be faster outside of the oven. I then started working on the hands. I used Procreate epoxy clay for this, but I later switched to green stuff. Uh, the Procreate clay was really hard. I don't know if this was because of the temperature in my workshop or if it's maybe too old. Um, I wanted to use the Procreate clay because it's gray and that makes it easier to smooth into the bake sculpt because it is also gray. To sculpt the hands, I first put on a layer of clay and then try to work them into shape with several tools. When I sculpt the hand, I tend to sculpt the knuckles after I've already sculpted the rest of the hand. Like this, I can easily smooth out the fingers and align them with the tendons and still have pronounced knuckles. Here you can see a small crack on the biceps. I don't know if this happened in baking or when I sculpted the hand. Um, I thought about gluing it, but I was a bit scared that it would be visible after or that it would crack again. And I then figured I could sculpt over some bandages to reinforce it and to create an extra detail. I then worked on the Lich's uh, shoulder bag. I was sure I could sculpt most of the details with green stuff, but for the metal rings I needed something else. I made some rings with brass wire and threaded the green stuff through it. For the shoulder strap I sculpted it first onto a plastic bag and let it partially cure. Like this it is still flexible, but I can't alter the shape too much anymore. I threaded it through the ring and superglued it onto itself and onto the bottom of the hood. With all the sculpting done, I started working on the plinth. I thought it would be smart to do this before painting, so I wouldn't have to worry about damaging the paint job. This black wood I have here looks like it's burned, but it was actually buried for over 600 years. I've had these pieces for a few years and I never knew what I could use them for. This ancient undead wizard seemed like the perfect fit for this medieval wood. Some of the pieces are almost falling off, so I didn't know how it would react to being cut. I carefully measured out a piece that I thought would hold up, and I really hoped the rough outside would remain intact, because I really wanted to use this for the plinth. I roughly cut out the pieces with a jigsaw, um, a bandsaw would have been more precise, but I didn't have one available at the time. After that, I carefully cut off more and more of the wood on the table saw. I prefer to use multiple cuts instead of one because I feel like it's more precise and it puts less stress on the wood, which makes a lot of sense since this wood is almost falling apart. When you are working with power tools, it is very important that you are taking the right precautions. I'm wearing protective gear and I thoroughly plan out what I want to do beforehand. I was super happy that the rough part of the wood remained intact, so I cut off this piece and sanded it smooth on the sides. <laughs> 
To attach the sculpture to the plinth, I wanted to use a threaded rod, so I had to drill a hole through the plinth. This was a little bit more complicated because of the rough end, so I had to make a jig to drill a nice parallel hole. First, I drilled a shallow hole with a diameter big enough for uh, the nut to fit in, and after that I drilled a smaller hole all the way through for the threaded rod. I then removed the part of the armature that was sticking out and I carefully drilled a hole into the sculpture. I took some epoxy glue and glued the rod into the sculpture, making sure it dried into the position that I wanted. The threaded rod doesn't look very nice, so I used a brass tube to conceal it. I polished it with some steel wool in my drill to make it nice and shiny. To protect the wood and to give it an even darker color, I oiled and buffed it up. Here you can see what I ended up with. After a layer of black primer, it was time to start painting. I watched some videos on using oil paints for miniatures and how they can create some great blends, so I decided to give this a try for this sculpt. I started directly with oil paints onto the primer, but in hindsight I should have used a base coat for everything in acrylics. Um, the oil paints are applied in really thin layers, so it can be a bit difficult to get good coverage. Uh, it was okay for now, but I will do it differently next time I use oil paints. The general idea with oil paints is that you can roughly sketch out where you want your highlights and shadows to go, and then take a dry brush to blend everything together. The oil paints dry a lot slower than acrylics, giving you a lot more time to work on blending your colors together. I'm using old synthetic brushes for this, because after using them for oil paints, they can pretty much only be used for oil paints. I highly recommend watching the videos on using oil paints by Vince Venturella. I'll be sure to link his channel into the description. Uh, Vince goes into a lot more detail than I ever could, and he has a lot more experience with using oil paints than I. The great thing about oil paints is the working time. Here you see me putting on a base coat on the hood and the next day I can apply some highlights and blend them right in without any problems. Blending in acrylics is something I'm still struggling with, so this makes it a lot easier for me. I couldn't really find how long I should let the oil paints dry because it really depends on how thick of a coat you've applied. Um, just to be sure, I let it dry for a week before putting on a matte varnish to protect it. After that, I started working on the details in acrylic paints. I started with the armor on his arm, which I painted non-metallic gold. Unfortunately, the angle in which I shot this is far from ideal. Also, I am far from an expert in non-metallic metals, so maybe it's for the better. For the hood, I again watched some videos from uh, Vince Venturella. I really can't believe how many videos he has on his channel. Basically, I used white and black paint to create scratches and marks on the leather hood, and then put a layer of brown ink over it. Because inks are transparent, the white and black shine through. Um, I really like this method, um, but I would definitely recommend watching Vince's videos on the subject. The work I did with the oil paints made it really easy for me to finish this piece with acrylics. I just needed to glaze some parts, 
add a little bit of wash here and there and some more pronounced highlights in some places. I wanted the eyes to really pop and since I made the skin blue I decided to use orange for the eyes as a contrast. I painted the eyes white and I glazed over an orange ink. After that I came back with a little white paint to make them look like they are glowing. I also glazed some ink around the eyes, after which I highlighted that with some light blue. I feel like this really sells the glowing effect of the eyes. And that's the end for this project, but I already have some great ideas for the next one. Uh, leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more of these kind of things. Or check out the link in the description for my Instagram page where I post regular updates on the stuff that I'm working on. For now, here are some final shots for you to enjoy and I hope to see you next time. Bye!